good morning. Uh, my name is Anna. I am from Brazil, the NIC.br. That's the company that uh, regulates the .br in Brazil. And today we will start the net network session that's called, uh, sorry, <laughs> Advancing Open Science Globally, Challenges and Opportunities. And um, the first one to talk is Henrique Xavier, who works with me. With me. And um, he holds a doctorate in physics from the University of Sao Paulo. And he was a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. And he has a postdoc. Uh, he is a postdoc uh, researcher at the University College of London. And currently, as I said, he serves as a researcher specializing in web science in, at NICBR. And uh, he is uh, actively uh, engages in open science, uh, open science practice. So, Henrique, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'll start with a brief overview of open science, uh, and I'll share some of my thoughts on uh, the challenges, um, more from the practitioner point of view. Then I'll leave uh, for the res actual researchers on open science to talk more about it. So, um, open science in a, in a short sentence would be uh, to make, uh, make uh, the, science, the science process and the science products available for everybody, regardless of nationalities, uh, institution affiliations, uh, levels of expertise and economic condition and, and other stuff as uh, gender and so on. Uh, the idea is that with open science, we can improve efficiency by sharing knowledge and sharing resources. Um, we can uh, reduce costs as well. Um, there is also, um, it, it may be a way to improve reproducibility in science as you, uh, you are al allow people first to see uh, the data you used and how, what the analysis in principle uh, well, at least if you adopt the good practices in open science, allows you to see, um, uh, people to see o o the analysis you did. So it, in, this in principle should help with uh, reproducibility as well. Um, it, sh it should also improve the social impact of uh, science. Uh, for instance, uh, during the COVID pandemic, there was uh, a large increase in uh, open access to publications uh, due to the time the need of timely information regarded regarding the pandemic um, and also uh, making a connection to points that have been discussed here in the in the forum uh, open science uh, for instance in health uh, could be a, 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 an important asset for fighting misinformation online so especially through one of its um, let's say ch uh, channels, which is uh, science, uh, citizen science, and public outreach. Um, so um, U UNESCO actually published a document, a recommendation for open science, uh, which was published in 2021 and was uh, accepted by 192 countries. So I think that's a, a good uh, uh, landmark uh, time time. Uh, yeah, well, a good event that happened, right? And um, it describes what open science is, and uh, it, 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 it separates in basically four um, uh, topics. I'll, I'll emphasize three of them, which is the open science, uh, the open access itself, uh, for instance, uh, so everybody has access to scientific publication, scientific knowledge, uh, uh, training material, and so on. Also, um, open access, you can also uh, expand that to open uh, access to data and also to the analysis made. Um, you also have a second uh, part of open science, which would be uh, open infrastructure. So 
both having infrastructure for sharing all this knowledge, like uh, repositories and uh, web journals, but also uh, sharing the resources and infrastructure needed to uh, perform uh, science, right? To conduct science. Uh, I come uh, coming from the astrophysics uh, um, field. Uh, there was one thing that I think m serves as an example is that uh, telescopes are nowadays very expensive uh, uh, machines and they are usually paid by a consortium of countries but many uh, projects uh, also open some time, some observing time uh, for the community as, uh, as a whole even if uh, it, the, the, the country didn't contribute to the um, to that project. Uh, so uh, it's a way of sharing some of the, at least part of the resources needed for doing research. And a third part of uh, that I would like to emphasize is the citizen science, which can, uh, has a few, um, uh, let's say, um, um, ways that um, are implemented, right? Uh, so one of each, one, uh, one of these ways is the crowdsourcing. So uh, 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 getting help from the public, from the general public to do science. Um, also that you can use uh, crowdfunding for science. And a public outreach is also uh, something that is important. Um, so making the science more intelligible and accessible to people that are not experts in the field. Another point in, open in citizen science is about making um, uh, amateur scientists and not, not necessarily professional ones uh, to be able to contribute better to, to science. And of course, uh, open science, I, I, I'm not sure if it would be impossible, but certainly would be very, would be very difficult without the internet. So the internet actually enables and fully enables uh, the creation of open science, right? So uh, I think that already raises some, of course, there are some regions that still needs uh, infrastructure, but it seems to me, then I'll, I'll also like to hear from the other uh, speakers and the, the audience, that uh, the main challenges to open science are more social and political, because the, the technical part, uh, apart from the access in certain regions of the world, uh, it's basically solved, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, from the challenges, I, I would, uh, for me as a practitioner, I think the access to publications is still, although it's an old topic, I guess, but it's still some an issue that uh, should be addressed. Um, I, the majority of scientific publications are still behind paywalls nowadays, and that may, but may, might be a challenge, especially for countries that uh, don't have as much funding uh, to pay for the subscriptions. Uh, another thing uh, uh, that uh, we could, um, um, let's say, adopt an IGF perspective using the multi-sectorial uh, way point of view would be in my view, to improve the participation as a, of the private sector as a contributor to open science. Uh, for instance, uh, nowadays, a lot of the data that is collected and a lot of the uh, research, especially in AI, for instance, or uh, data from social media, they are collected and um, conducted by uh, private companies. And it's not necessarily easy to access uh, data from these uh, platforms or uh, have access to uh, the AI models and data used to train them. Uh, and probably open science uh, in this way could uh, improve also all the questions we've been discussing here uh, could help to solve many of the problems we've been discussing uh, regarding AI. And um, finally, um, let me see. Maybe um, open science also, I, well, I'll, I'll leave it for, for the speakers uh, to, to com uh, compliment. And I'll like uh, to, well, I'll, I'll leave for, sorry, I'll leave for Anna to conduct the next, uh, uh, next part of the talk. Okay. Thank you, Enrique.
um, as the next to talk about open science here is Mr. Uh, Kazuhiro ha Hayashi. He holds a master's degree in chemistry, <coughs> sorry, from the University of Tokyo. And uh, he is recognized as a prominent figure in the field of open science. He has served as an expert member for various institutions, including UNESCO, uh, G7, and OECD. And additionally, he, is co he co founded the Japan Open Science Summit. And currently, he serves as a director of the Research Unit for Data Application at the National Institute of Science and Technology po Policy in Japan. Please, Mr. Kazuhiro. Uh, thank you for kind introduction. I'm Kaz Hayashi from the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology Policy in Japan. Uh, uh, so-called nice step. Our institution is a kind of a think tank research institu institution for the government to uh, provide uh, evidence for the uh, science technology policy. And I'm uh, supposed to be the expert of <laughs> open science. And uh, today I would like to introduce the uh, uh, current background of the open science uh, from the viewpoint of Japan's open science policy. And here is a, a cheat sheet of the kind of a digital transformation since 1990s. Uh, from digital transformation of a scholarly journal with this XML publishing, I was a chemist and I was also a computer geek to develop the, uh, this system at the Chemical Society of Japan uh, to digitalize the, uh, digitalize the, the uh, journal of the uh, Land Society in Japan. And afterwards, the uh, open access movement came, and uh, in 2005, we implemented open access. And uh, uh, at that time, the open access movement is still in the early age, but uh, uh, some uh, policy makers uh, were, have been keen on that uh, issues, and uh, that it, uh, would expand to the not only the open access, but also the uh, sharing the research data as open as possible. And in, after COVID-19, uh, we are entering a kind of a reopenness of science itself. Let's say the citizen science, as, uh, as uh, Henrik introduced, all uh, about uh, science, uh, virtual, uh, soci uh, virtual society or blockchain-based uh, uh, science scientific system is uh, uh, being launched recently. So my research question is uh, starting from the digitalization, digitalization of journals and the, the, the uh, digital transformation for society and the media, and it it's changed to the uh, it was changed to the digital transformation for research outputs focusing on the data and the multi-dimensional uh, impacts. And now I'm keen on the digital transformation of research, uh, research and the communities themselves. And uh, we ask, uh, my final research question is, uh, uh, I wish to know how science and society would be changed eventually. So, and, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, this is uh, my chart for the cabinet office in 2014 to explain that what is open science. Open science, uh, from the viewpoint of open access, is, uh, uh, let's say, open access is just access to the article. But open science is uh, uh, sharing the research output and allow them to reuse it, or the opening research activity itself. That's the beauty of open science, and it includes uh, some, uh, some previous uh, initiatives of uh, data sharing, or open source, open innovation, or even uh, citizen science. Uh, so the open science has a very uh, ambiguous but a kind of uh, uh, inclusive concept to change a science, society, and science and society. So, uh, and uh, here this chart is uh, for UNESCO uh, in uh, 2019, before the re UNESCO's recommendation. I was an uh, international advisory committee member of the UNESCO's open science recommendation. And at, at this, uh, at, uh, 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 by this chart, I would like to stress that open access, uh, open science is a movement to transform science society and science and society on global context driven by the advancement of ICT, 
uh, especially thanks for the internet. Uh, so, and we are entering from the published or perished world to the uh, share or perished world. And we are still in a transition state because the, we are still based on the legacy print based framework, legal society framework, or any other uh, social system was, is still based on the printed paste or uh, uh, something uh, robust but legacy, established but legacy one. So we are going into the uh, kind of a somewhat chaotic phase or a transition state uh, to transform to the new order. So that for, for, for that purpose, uh, this is my uh, self-introduction slide, and uh, I, was a, I am a bridging agent to, uh, as a self-multi-stakeholder involvement uh, person, a catalytic researcher who has been working to solve societal problems in science uh, using ICT since 1990s, and has been encouraging the transformation to an open science paradigm, uh, so-called digital transformation, by engaging with various stakeholders. And uh, uh, see the poli uh, I'm in the uh, policy side now as an expert member of the UNESCO G7 OECD cabinet office and so on. But uh, uh, as well as I am a member of the Science Council of Japan, it's very unique because uh, both are kind of a uh, Mm, not not enemy, but anyway, <laughs> it's a kind of a, a different stakeholder. But uh, I, was, uh, I am a bridging agent to between policy and academia to, uh, let's say, develop some, some open science policy uh, with uh, practical implementation. And those bridging activities have been based on the, my real uh, experience of the uh, trans-sectoral uh, trans practice-based dialogue and awareness raising, uh, let's say, that as a scientist or uh, as a e-journal uh, or uh, as a publisher with e-journals or, or a foresight with librarian, librarians and others or uh, any other research data sharing practice, let's say, the research uh, data alliance, I, I, uh, I have a lot of acquaintances to uh, discuss, and here I'm very happy to have a, a connection to, of IGF to uh, discuss this matter. And uh, finally, these activities are rather uh, focusing on the open access of publication and research data sharing uh, by the policy development. But uh, uh, here, as I introduced at the, uh, at the beginning, we are entering a kind of a new uh, transformation, let's say the uh, citizen science, uh, virtual society, the decentralized science, science with blockchain. So how uh, don't we enjoy this uh, movement to implement for the future? So that's, uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kazuhiro. Now, um, I'll call Mrs. Sarita Aubag Aubagli. Um, he earned, she earned her doctorate in ge geography from the Feder Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and pursued uh, her postdoctoral research at the London School of Economics and Political Science with considerable uh, expertise in journal editing uh, she currently serves as a coordinator of the Open Science and Citizen Innovation Laboratory at the Brazilian Institute of Information in Science and Technology. So please, Sarita. Uh, hello, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. It's a pity I cannot be with you in person. I will briefly present a set of topics and uh, debate today about the open science movement, especially from a Latin American perspective. Although open science is an international movement, it involves local and regional specificities, views, and issues. I will organize my presentation into, into five groups of questions of, or issues. The first question is, which openness? This question refers to the very meaning and scope of the idea of opening science. The open science movement was initially driven by the open access movement for scientific publications since the last decade of the 20th century, 
as a reaction of the high prices charged by some international commercial publishers. This made it difficult to disseminate research results and therefore the advancement of science, especially that financed with public resources. It soon became clear that access to scientific literature was not enough to expand the circulation of knowledge and its social appropriation. Open science can today be understood as a movement of movements, that is, it is a process under construction which covers several fronts from open scientific publications and research data, open scientific tools and infrastructure, open education and citizen science. Therefore, more than an umbrella term, open science requires the convergence or intersection of these various threads. Progressively, uh, Sorry, oops. Progressive, the notion of openness uh, moves from a pragmatic vision, increasing volume, speed, and quality towards a democratic vision, or at least a combination of these two perspectives, the pragmatic and the democratic ones. This is especially, oops. This is especially relevant for countries in the global South and Latin America in particular. The second question is, what science? Open science for what? This question implies once again that what is at stake is, at stake is not only the quantitative dimension of openness, but also the type of science and knowledge that we will need to produce. Many point out that the dominant scientific paradigms have promoted invisibility and have created obstacles to the advance and recognition of other and more diverse scientific trajectories and types of knowledge that could give way to more sustainable development paths. There is also a geopolitical dimension here. On the one hand, the consequences of the present social environmental crisis are global, the entire world is under threat and therefore require articulated efforts on a planetary scale. On the other hand, the impacts of the crisis and the conditions to confront it are not equally distributed. Its causes and impacts are different and unequal and are felt, especially in the most vulnerable regions and social groups. The third question is open science for whom? Who counts? The open science challenge also involves the recognition and incorporation of other actors, other epistemologies and narratives, as well as the contributions of both the peripheries of the global scenario and social groups from below. These lines of thought have sought to make visible the worldviews and epistemic perspectives of traditional peoples, vulnerable populations, socially stigmatized groups, knowledge based on experience, the so-called lay expertise. Today, this knowledge has been valued to face the present planetary crisis. They propose, promoted what they con we consider cognitive justice. The fourth citizen science was included as part of the open science movement. In the UNESCO's recent recommendations for a global strategy for open science, Two of the four main strategic axes are oriented towards the contributions of citizen science. On the other hand, social participation in science expands to, uh, to the idea of co-production of knowledge with more horizontal relationships between different actors and their different experiences. The very notion of citizenship is expanded and redefined to include the idea of scientific citizenship. The fourth question is, what counts? This question refers to the growing convergence regarding the need to reformulate the evaluation systems of scientific research and its institutions as a central requirement for the broad adoption, broad adoption and institutionalization of open and citizen science. This includes criteria for recognizing, rewarding, and evaluating researchers their access to research funding and career progression criteria. The fifth question is, under what conditions? In a schematic way, two major perspectives are contrasted here. That of open washing, in which open science becomes a profitable business model for large, large private publishers moving away from its, uh, its original principles 
and fair open science, that is openness as a promoted of, promoter of other forms of governance, diversity and dialogue between knowledges and science. In the first case, the conversion of open science into a business model for large publishers, the charging of high article processing charge, APCs, stands out. These new business models also include the verticalization in the offer by these same companies or other associated with them of services and tools for the dis discovery, extraction and analysis of academic data which corresponds to an academic platform platformization. The risk for Latin American countries is that open access transitions toward a centrally commercial model imposing on us the APC model at prices that are unviable for our realities, in addition to the dependence on paid information search and retrieval services produced by the journals themselves. There is also the risk of subordination of our academic communities to evaluation criteria and methodologies guided by algorithmic parameters that are often foreign to our own interests and reality. Open infrastructure is important here in addition to the adoption of open platforms, tools and standards and codes also, the adoption of open governance systems and protocols in ensuring control by academic communities. On the other hand, fair open science propose some new agendas, such as from open access to open publication, including multilingualism and by bibliodiversity, from the fair principles for open data from predator findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable to data sovereignty and the care principles, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. From alternative metrics to all the evaluation criteria, from intellectual properties to open license and the public domain, from open infrastructures to horizontal and community governance, from traditional citizen science to extreme science, citizen science and the great dialogue in science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarita. Um, now uh, I will ask, um, one moment, Carolina Botero. She is the director of Charisma Foundation and serves as a columnist for both El Espectador and La Silla Vacia. With a background in law, she holds a master's degree in international and cooperation law, as well as in trade, and contract <coughs> in trade and contract law. She's a member of the board of directors for Creativity Commons and of CSISAC, the Civil Society Observer Group of the OECD. Please, Carolina. Thank you very much and good evening. Um, I, I, I decided to focus my, my intervention on the, on the challenges of uh, intellectual property rights in the frame of open science. Uh, as, mo as, as I completely follow what Sarita has already said for the Latin American countries in the issues of open science. So um, I would like to remember that during the pandemic, while during 2021, the countries lived their very own drama and were not able to provide vaccines, some even during many more months, the question was no longer how do we keep the current status quo of intellectual property? It was how can open science reduce harm? And it is, why did we allow the collaboration that boosts the production of a vaccine not to be the rule for its deployment, but instead it turned out into another way of increasing profits for few? These questions continue to be the case because the truth is that not even the pandemic allowed us to change the power relations. So analysis of open science and other open collaborations efforts show that flexibilities and open licenses mechanisms favors innovation and creativity, allowing a faster pace of problem solving and adaptation of technical solutions to local realities. It is a great tool for collective 
uh, intelligence. Moreover, focusing on public health, the frustration that uh, we now face on, on the fact that we were not able to, to achieve the power relation is because uh, this situation is also lived by millions of people in the world that live with orphan diseases. The health emergencies that we are that we live during the pandemic is their day to day. For those people, open science is not new. For them, it is what potentiates experiments that are already under development. For many of them, open science is the road to take because they will never be a market. This is why uh, the, the phrases said, for instance, by Mariana Mazzucato during the pandemic, when she said during the pandemic crisis, when it, when it is not enough to have one vaccine, there are already six. What you, need, what you really need is to assure the actual vaccination for all, among other things. States continues to think of IP to extract value and not to leverage collective intelligence. This kind of, of uh, thinking should be now the rule, but it is not. The point is that Masukato's words puts a state dilemma on the table and helps me to give some dot points here. First one, the best place to remind us that science is a right of all that is the basis for sustainable development is, un is, is precisely to discuss open science. And it is also to remind us that intellectual property is not the one that saves lives. It is a tool that has been designed for value extraction, linked to control and exclusivity. While from a public interest perspective, it is also the instrument that was hacked to be used for global knowledge sharing. Concerns that if open science goes against intellectual property are really concerns on how to preserve the current intellectual property regime. It has, al it has always said also that the most disrupt disruptive element of open science is that it has been developed within the intellectual property regime and it will continue to do so. Voluntarily open science licenses are key of course to this, pro to this process. However, it is important to understand that open science requires also the person of public interest on and this thing, this means that we need to change on the objective pos position that the states have before the intellectual property states need to look beyond well-rooted intellectual property status quo they need to seek public interest because of inequalities states need to intentional seek balance that is not on the intellectual property system right now again in the words of Masukato as long as, the, as intellectual property rights control knowledge, it cannot continue to have its focus on extracting value alone, especially when the public investment is on a stage. So finally, I would like to recall here um, the draft, the, the UNESCO recommendations on open science that has, be re, has already been mentioned a couple of times to, to, to highlight that it needs to recognize that the that the intellectual property regime needs to recognize the flexibility because uh, the protection is not enough. Under the current discussion that continues about the patents uh, and its role on, on the, on the uh, public health system, we require to acknowledge and promote open science. We have to we have to deal with intellectual property regimes, not only in patents, but also in copyright. It is necessary that the value extraction model creates uniformity in protection, but also to bring it to the flexibilities. Recent work, for instance, at American University concluded, concluded that fewer than 25% of countries have copyright systems that permit the text and data mining research that is key for health. It was the key at least to identify the and, and predict the, the COVID pandemic. This, uh, it, it is necessary also to understand that vulnerable countries had extensively, extensively developed the value extraction side of intellectual property, but on the other hand, they had not include in their system the mechanism of flexibilities. In recent research done by the Alliance of, uh, of Open Knowledge, sorry, of Access to Knowledge in Latin America, we found that there is not even one country in the region that includes uh, the necessary exceptions and limitations for research. Even less, they will be able to use, for instance, artificial intelligence techniques to develop science. 
They, they are not complying even with the international standards. Science needs to be seen, therefore, as a public good. For state higher purposes, openness should be the rule. And under this logic, not only intellectual property, but other considerations, such as privacy concerns, for instance, need to be pushed for, for to consider openness and as possible and clo <laughs> the to push for open as more as the most possible and close only as needed. So the questions have dramatically dramatically changed after the pandemic, but we are still trapped with the same official answer answers. We need to change. And open science is one way. It needs to change with its rules and, and logics. Also the idea of uh, exclusively protection for intellectual property regimes. But thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you Carolina. Uh, now, uh, we have a question. It's my question. <laughs> 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 for Mr. Kasuhiro, please. <laughs> Um, it's a personal question because I work uh, with open data and I am interested in open science. So I was wondering how does Japan handle to publication of scientists, scientific articles? Um, do you have any policy that encourage uh, publishing that in an open model? Oh, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, uh, we Japan has a, a, a soft recommendation of open access to public funding research, uh, so-called green open access rule to uh, make the author's final version upload on the institutional repository of each university. That's my uh, our first uh, policy development for the open access. And in addition to that, uh, uh, based on the uh, collaboration on the G7 uh, countries, we are developing an international infrastructure for research data sharing uh, for the future, uh, future, let's say, dissemination platform uh, towards open science paradigm. But it's too ideal to uh, implement at current stage. So we are going back to the open access policy uh, policy since uh, and uh, since uh, from uh, uh, 2025, we are going to mandate uh, the immediate open access publication uh, by public funded research, and uh, we are now very active to uh, implement that uh, mandate policy uh, to implement practically among stakeholders. That's a chap the Japan state. And uh, uh, I, I should say that the uh, Japan scholarly publication state uh, in a, another aspect that uh, uh, we have an open access journal platform called JSTAGE. It has uh, over 3,000 journals with two, more than 2,000 land societies in Japan. Uh, it's like a Sierra in uh, Brazil. Uh, but, uh, uh, in reality, uh, Japanese scientists uh, is likely to publish their research output to the uh, journals outside Japan. That's a problem. So we have to uh, develop some incentive model to uh, the uh, transformation of uh, dissemination of scholar uh, scholarly output. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, now. I just noticed that uh, I was rude. I should <laughs> uh, open to the to the audience, ask the question first, but I was so curious. So it's open. If uh, the audience has some questions, you can do it now. You're looking for open questions. It's, oh yeah, <laughs> it's it's Vince Surf. Um, I have just an incredible pile of questions, uh, and I'm trying to put down a list of the desirable properties of an open science environment. What's the ecosystem look like? And uh, so some of the questions that we have to answer, I think, are first of all discovery. How do I discover 
publications, experiments, databases uh, related to science. Uh, Google tries to contribute with Google Scholar, but it doesn't cover 100% of everything. So we need to answer the question, how will uh, scientific results be discovered? The second one has to do with uh, after you've discovered them, uh, will they have standardized formats so that uh, the documents that uh, the document the science and the databases that contain the information are uh, manageable so how, how where will those standard formats come from some of you are familiar with something called schema.org which was set up uh, by Google uh, and others in order to uh, document uh, the formats of the various data that we might find uh, another thing that we would be looking for in this desirable properties list is the design of the experiments themselves. Have we documented the experiments, uh, the instruments that were used, calibration methods, and so on? This is all aimed at reproducibility of the, of the experiments. Uh, the, a big problem is which software might have been used to analyze the uh, results. Is that software available, and will it be available in the future? Uh, and, and how does it uh, get paid for? Uh, unfortunately, open source software may not be the perfect solution either because we all know that often it doesn't get adequate attention in terms of maintenance. And, uh, and to say, make matters worse, sometimes open software has bugs that are exploitable and that lead to vulnerabilities, potentially also leading to um, loss of integrity of the scientific data that you hope uh, it would be helpful in reproducing the experiments. And then there's the really hard problem is who pays for all this? Uh, and how do we pay for it long enough that the science is usefully accessible over time? Uh, I, I won't go on and on. I, mean, I could, but uh, the point I want to make is that uh, if we are trying to promote open science, I think we need to collectively answer a lot of these questions. The hardest one, I think, still is funding. Archive, for instance, is essentially a sponsored database. Someone pays for that, to, for all of our benefit as a result. Is that the only successful model, or can there be others? I'll suggest one or two others that might be uh, of interest. One of them is the Research Data Alliance that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation which continues as far as I know. Uh, another, um, uh, th th we talked a little bit in several of the presentations about uh, open source, uh, I mean uh, open access uh, methods where uh, the parties who are publishing basically pay to make the information openly accessible. But once again, we have the problem that not everyone is in a position to pay for that kind of uh, open access. So we need to find funding models that will work. Uh, we look for the beneficiaries uh, of the open source and o open uh, science data. The private sector may benefit from that. We might turn to the private sector and ask for their help as well. But you have to sell the model to, uh, to them. So I'll, I'll stop there. That may not be exactly a set of questions, but I do wonder if we've documented answers to these things. Uh, could an output of the IGF include an essay called Desirable Properties of an Open Science System and then list what those properties are and then ask the questions if we don't answer them about how to achieve those, um, those properties. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think <laughs> it's too difficult to <laughs> answer these questions. <laughs> Well, well, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on uh, Vincerf's uh, comments. After okay, you, after you. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, from policy side, uh, I'd like to introduce the current stage uh, situation to implement uh, the open science, including their questions. So, uh, from my point of view, we use a kind of hybrid pathway. One is a uh, uh, practical uh, but short, uh, uh, short vision, uh, practical methodology with short vision. Let's say that uh, we mandated open access to the public, uh, uh, scholarly journals, and it, it is now associ being associated with uh, uh, 
uh, sharing uh, the data of the publication. So it is closely related to the incentive to share uh, research data for researchers. You know that our uh, current e ecosystem of uh, scholarly publication with evaluation is too robust to change rapidly. So within a uh, uh, reputation model or the evaluation model of the scholarly ecosystem uh, based on the print, uh, be, uh, not print, uh, uh, journal, art, journal articles, uh, we encourage uh, researchers to share their research data with open access article. That's a kind of start, a trigger, a trigger methodology strategy. And uh, on the contrary, we are aiming a kind of a totally new, uh, develop a totally new ecosystem with research data sharing. Let's say the European Open Science Cloud is seeking a way to the develop a platform for research data sharing without somewhat without uh, journal publication system. Alternative, let's say, on an alternative due to the journal publication or uh, to disseminate the research output. So, but uh, as I introduced uh, in my uh, talk, so it's very hard for them to incentivize to move to, uh, let's say, uh, enjoy on the new platform. So we, we are, thinking a kind of uh, intermediate uh, uh, methodology or a strategy. And it, it includes uh, the standard, uh, standardization of data format for easier dissemination of research data sharing, or any other development of software for make researchers uh, comfortable for <laughs> research, research activity itself. So it's kind of a pre-competitive situation among the, even in a uh, uh, G7 country or any other UNESCO, uh, UNESCO's uh, 193 uh, countries, so uh, we are, uh, let's say, the, on the uh, base, uh, I, yeah, I really uh, astonished to uh, be here to ha uh, see that how IGF is, uh, is a uh, basic infrastructure for implementation of open science itself, and uh, why did, uh, did we have a any collaboration uh, so far, but it's now a good time to uh, seek a way, uh, seek some, uh, some, some dialogue uh, first to develop something different uh, uh, to the current robust but the legacy uh, scholarly communication um, system. So. Since I still have an open microphone, uh, I, I had mentioned earlier uh, one possible outcome of an IGF event like this is this paper on desirable properties of an open science ecosystem. Let me suggest another possible outcome. That's foundational underpinnings of an open science uh, ecosystem. And here we'd be talking about the technical underpinnings. What standards need to be in place that we would all adhere to in order to make our data um, usable? by uh, other parties. Uh, there might be some lessons here from uh, early history of uh, national research and education networks. In the early days of the internet, around the mid-1980s, we started to see research agencies around the world funding the implementation of networks to link universities to each other on a global scale. The National Science Foundation in the US had a program called the International Connections Program mm -hmm. where they paid for uh, the connectivity between national research networks for a period of time. I don't know if they still do that, but that uh, enabled a number of different computer-based systems to be interconnected around the world to share uh, their research results. There's another, um, so that's one possibility to, to talk to the very, invite the various research agencies to come to the IGF and talk about that. There's another concept which uh, has been um, very popular at, at Google and at NSF and it's called a data commons. <laughs> and here, certain kinds of data, certain kinds of statistical data can be ingested into a large scale, for all practical purposes, billion row, billion columns spreadsheet. The reason that's interesting is that for that kind of statistical data, uh, once it's all in, in place and the 
um, the data, the meaning of the data is incorporated in there, the, the metadata, then you can use the system to generate charts and graphs and other things that uh, can almost be done automatically. You could ask for certain kinds of plots of data. Not all data falls into that category, but the idea of creating a data commons for some kinds of data could be very attractive. Last point, there is uh, a, an organization, um, the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which accumulates uh, and tries to establish standards for space data, whether it's uh, Earth observation or astronomical observation. And they uh, incorporated something called OAIS, which is uh, a, a standard for mm -hmm. archive systems. And I've been promoting the idea of not simply writing the standards, but also demonstrating interoperability among the archives. And the reason that's important is that if for some reason the funding model breaks, then uh, an archive could pick up the responsibility for ingesting the data for a failing archive because of the standards. So these are all things that I would like to see groups like this document as output from the IGF. And I'm, here I'm speaking with my chairman of the leadership panel hat on. We need to demonstrate to uh, legislators around the world and especially to uh, the UN that the IGF is producing actionable results. Not just discussing them, but, but producing things that we can use. And so this is a, is a possible place for you to contribute to that argument. Thank you. Uh, we have another two persons. Uh, yeah, the speakers uh, are handed. <laughs> so, Sarita, please. Well, uh, I think this issue, this topic is very, very important. Who pays is the same question we have made uh, about the climate emergence. Uh, who pays for that? It's a global issue, but uh, different responsibilities. So looking from, from a different perspective, I think we pay already a lot for a closed science, not only because of the high financial resources needed to access research results, most of which are financed with public resources, but also because of the social, environmental and health impacts of not having free access to this knowledge. So if you think from a different perspective, it's much more cheaper <laughs> to have open science than, than closed close science. And now Carolina. Thank you. Um, yes, I was thinking that as if we are moving to a, so to a science that is highly depending on data, there is there are also many power asymmetries that need to be uh, addressed. Countries like mine, developing countries, are countries that are basically consumers of data rather than producers, uh, or are producers but are producers for those um, those countries from the north that are able to use them uh, at bigger scale to in order to try and achieve this and allow also uh, developing countries to be participants of a of a science that is based on data we really need to also speak about uh, the change on 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 the legal uh, framework to for uh, research and this is something that is is highly dependent on on the forms such as WIPO. Uh, then there is a need to discuss these topics and 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 leverage uh, level the field for all the countries to be able to use data for research purposes, um, not just to. Um, I mean, I was listening to Binserf, and yes, it's good to to do the mapping of the possible infrastructures and so on. But it's also we also need to do the analysis on what are the legal reforms that are needed. This is something that is often done by the uh, countries in the north, but it is less an ability that countries in the south have developed, and we need to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, now we have another question uh, from Enrique. Please, Enrique. Okay. So. Um, Sarita, I would like to know from your perspective, like uh, the, the issues that you raised, 
if we can think of any, uh, let's say, call to action, which is one of the, let's say, goals and what Vince uh, Sir mentioned, like we, we should come up with uh, practical uh, things to do, like how to implement the, so how to solve this problem. So I was thinking for the problems that you uh, raised, uh, do, you, do you have any suggestions on paths to take? And maybe uh, do you think that uh, global organizations such as UNESCO could play a role in this kind of thing or, or some other form of uh, organization? Thank you. So it's been, I, I have a response to directly to that question. Um, one of them has to do with the, what institutions might be helpful. UNESCO is clearly one of them. Another is the International Science Council. If you haven't heard of them, they are council.science. And uh, once again, they are a, a, a powerful platform, at least for articulating mm -hmm. the importance of uh, open science. Uh, so I would recommend collaboration with them as an example. I think you already know about them because you were nodding your heads. Um, if we come back for a moment to the paper that I was suggesting we consider writing desirable properties of an open science ecosystem, uh, what we would make ourselves do effectively is list the various properties that we want and then ask questions about how that can be achieved. And even if we don't have answers, at least we've got the questions. <laughs> Uh, and, and we could make that part of an agenda for achieving open science by uh, trying to solve each of those questions one by one or finding a place where those questions could be asked and dealt with. Uh, I would love to see existence proofs because sometimes that helps people understand that it's possible to achieve these objectives. So if we build something and show that it works, then at least there isn't the question, is it possible to do this? because you've demonstrated the capability. Here's an example of something that I think would be very useful. If you think about data preservation over a long period of time, which I, I'm thinking here hundreds, hundreds of years, um, the problem we end up with is that the software that was used to analyze the data or collect the data might not run 100 years from now mm -hmm. on the operating systems and machines of the day. So what should we do about that? Well, one possibility is to maintain an archive of the instruction set architecture of the computers and old operating systems and old applications and maintain that database so you can run old software against the old data. Another possibility, of course, is transforming the data so that it's still understandable in, in new incarnations of operating systems and applications. But these are the kinds of things that you'd want to have captured uh, in this uh, existence proofs that things are possible. Okay. And Carnegie Mellon has demonstrated, for example, that you can actually run old software uh, on simulated old machines. Okay, thank you. Sarita? Okay, I'm Sarita. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I think uh, open science is a political m movement, as you mentioned, Henrique is not uh, just a tech, I think technical problem, we don't have really very uh, difficult technical problems. I think we uh, we have the, the, the tools to to uh, have the, the solutions for these technical problems. I think the, the biggest problems are political, economic, and so on. And uh, yes, UNESCO is very important. Has been very important uh, this document, and we have a very very powerful Latin American movement. Uh, from America, La, La, La Referencia, Cielo, many, many very powerful organizations that are very, uh, doing a very uh, powerful movement for a different uh, view uh, uh, from uh, what we call a, a fair open, open science. And I think we are influencing the, the worldwide uh, debate even the coalition S, the, from the plan S, are changing their view from uh, APC to Diamond's uh, uh, open open access. That is, you don't have to pay for for publishing or to for reading. So I think uh, the uh, social and political mobilization is very very important and have some results. So 
So uh, thank you for so much, everyone. Oh, we have another question. I'm Michael Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, <laughs> I'm actually trained as a geophysicist, so back when big data was a few megabytes, I was doing seismology research. But in my current job, I do a lot on data policy around the world. Vint has mentioned a couple of organizations, the Council.Science and the uh, Research Data Alliance, which I've been involved in. I'm curious what the panelists and others think are the, the groups that are doing the most innovative things to answer the questions that, that Vint laid out there. Uh, I work with the National Academies of Sciences in, in Washington. And, uh, we have a committee, a national committee for co-data, which I'm on, and that's a, a wonderful global network, but I don't think it's realizing its potential. Part of it is funding. Um, Part of it is the very different needs of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Health data has to contend with private data protection laws. If you're doing agricultural research or designing sewage treatment plants, you don't have that problem. So if people could point to the, the international groups that you think are fostering the sharing of lessons learned I'd be very well, uh, very happy to hear that. And then I have a follow-up question as well. Uh, thank you for the comment. Um, sadly, for mostly for me, I think of the other participants too. We have to end the the, the networking session because we are starting another one uh, soon. So I would. Thank you. Well, well, can I ask my other question real quickly? Oh my it's, God! Because it's I'm a so one, sorry. it's a one question. It's I'm a one question, and you can answer it in two words. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I used to be a professor at Georgetown in the communications, culture, and technology program. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that stands in the way of getting things done is when people have a bad idea in their head because they have a bad slogan that <laughs> everybody repeats. <laughs> and I think you know what slogan I'm talking about. <laughs> data is the new oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many policymakers have told me that as a way to justify <laughs> data protection. So what is what is the answer? I argue that data is the new water. Mm -hmm. mm. It flows across borders. Much of it is stuck in the ice sheet so we can't get it or in the deep ocean. Some of it comes in special cans and is very valuable and is analyzed and pure. <laughs> Anybody have other, other ideas? I, I, I know it's not the new plutonium. That's the other <laughs> slogan to avoid. So two word answer. What's, what's, the new, what's, the, what's the best analogy for data? Well, air. Air? Yeah. That's my second one. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like water. Yeah. You use yeah, it, yeah, you yeah. reuse it, you filter it. And uh, it's inevitable to <laughs> consume it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree, and uh, I would um, raise re-raise re the question I, I gave it. Uh, well, I s I pointed out in the beginning, which was, uh, can we uh, can the private sector contribute in the sense of providing the data that it collects, uh, especially from my, from my point of view, that as uh, as a web scientist, I am interested in data like from social networks and uh, uh, web searches and stuff like that. And it's not necessarily easy to get access to this kind of data. Or uh, for uh, data that was used for training AI, uh, the big models from big companies, and, and the models itself. So uh, yes, I think the, the water should, we should have access to that water as well. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was rude again. <laughs> Uh, so now, uh, do you have another question or another comment? <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here. For being here. Um, it was a rich conversation, a rich uh, Q&A. <laughs> and um, that's it. Thank you for the audience too.
Bye. Thank you.